Dr. Anderson, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Appreciate you taking the time to jump on. Uh, this is our first speaker series with you on game using the Zoom format. Uh, we have currently, it looks like there's more than 20 people in the meeting and several people waiting to jump on. So, um, you know, I'm multitasking, allowing people in as we speak, but um, just great to have you jump on. How's everything been going with the with the pandemic and quarantining and, and everything on your end? It's, I think it's created a lot more work for us in, in, in many ways. You know, I think when this first started, we were thinking it was going to slow down a little bit, but um, a lot of people have been really reaching out to do some of the, the more mindset training. And then I think there's been a lot more stress, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of changes to a lot of people's routines uh, that's created a, a lot of stress for folks. And so we've been busy on that front as well. Sounds good. Well, I'm just going to read a little bit about you. Uh, sure. We have Dr. Justin Anderson. Uh, he is a psychologist and the director and founder of Premier Sports Psychology based in Minneapolis. Um, he is a licensed psychologist who specializes in high performance psychology and leadership over the last 20 years. He's had the opportunity to work with the best of the best in sports and business. Uh, he's helped countless professionals, Olympians and collegiate athletes gain an advantage in their mindset and mental preparation. So that, that's awesome, doctor, uh, for, for you to be involved in that. And I'll just I'll just let you begin. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate being here and and and, and being a, able to be a part of such a great organization like like you all are, are created and, and have developed here. It's it's really an honor to be here. And um, you know, I, I think the field of sports psychology just in general has really expanded quite a bit over the last uh, really the last decade. But the last five years, we have seen. Uh, uh, just an explosion, quite honestly, with with how many people are interested in developing the mindset. I think we've had a lot of athletes over a number of years talk about how mental the game is, but we didn't have many people really talking to us about how. How do we develop that part of our game? How do we get better uh, more quickly on the mental game? And most of the time, what we found is it was you needed to be a veteran. The longer you went, the more you learned and the more you knew about your, your mindset and what worked better for you and what didn't work for you. And oftentimes we saw athletes that were really good physically not make it to the next level because they had something mentally blocking them from, from getting to, to, to maximize their full potential. Those that got to the next level somehow, some way had found a way to kind of connect those two but the ones that stuck at the professional levels who had multi-year contracts at the pro levels were got incredibly good at the mental game. And so a lot of times they'd lose a step in their physicality or their, their physical nature as they got older in their career, but they gained two steps because they were quicker at anticipating, they were more efficient with their time, more efficient with their energy. And with that, they were able to, um, to get very good. One, one thing, I was working with a, an NFL team here not, not too long ago, this just this last fall, and I ran them through what we call our mindset matrix, which is a, a, a program, a model that we use in our premier mindset program. But uh, the mindset matrix really looks at five components that goes into the mindset. And what I find fascinating is coaches all the time, and I, I was a high school coach, I coached football and baseball uh, at, in high school, and back and way up, I, I, uh, I was an athlete, three sport athlete in high school, played football, basketball, and baseball. Um, captain of the football team, captain of the baseball team, or basketball team, and then uh, we didn't have captains in baseball. But um, then I went on to play football at, in college. Uh, so I, I played a number of different sports and a number of different levels. But one of the things that I always heard coaches say out there is focus, but they never really told you what or how to focus, what to focus on or how to focus. Uh, and two, they would talk a lot about, hey, this guy's got the great mindset. He's got a great mindset. But what, what went in? What goes into a great mindset? What really is that all about? Well, the last five to 10 years, the field of sports psychology has been studying that. We have been looking at that really, really closely. And the first time in our existence as humans, we've got the technology now to see inside the brain while the brain is actually doing activities. 
prior to about 10, 15 years ago, we couldn't see inside the brain while people were thinking. The only way in was after somebody had passed uh, is we were able to, to take a look at and, and see how, how things were going. Or somebody had a, psycho, or a, a brain injury and we realized that, oh, they got hit in this side of the brain and they lost their emotion. So we knew that this part of the brain had something to do with emotions. That's really how we were um, determining what was going on and where different aspects of the brain uh, were, were how they were functioning. Five, five, 10 years ago, uh, we've got the technology to be able to see inside the brain and do functional MRIs and, and functional CAT scans where we can put um, images or uh, games in front of athletes or, or people and get to see what parts of their brains light up, what parts of their brains are firing and, and why are they firing that way? So we got to really map out what is going on in the brain from emotions and why do we get emotional and what gets us emotional and when what happens to our logic centers of the brain when we're, when we're really emotional and what happens to our motor cortex. So we got to learn a lot about this. That learning has allowed us for people like me who work very closely with the athletes and the coaches and the executives to say, how are they doing and how are they functioning from an optimization standpoint? Is there anything, just like we do with strength and conditioning, anything we can do technique wise to get you to be stronger and faster? Well, that's really what I do with the mind. And if we, we think about things a little differently, we hold our attention to certain variables versus letting go of other variables, we start and we say certain things to ourselves, we start to see our performances pick up. It's like, hey, I'm gaining, I'm gaining several uh, uh, tenths of a second on my 40 time or on my mental time by, by changing the way I think or what I focus on. And so we, we've started to really put those, those attributes in place and then the reason why the field is really blowing up is we're starting to see a lot of athletes see the benefits of that. So there's nothing in sport. If you can't prove it, people won't use it. And, um, and so there's got to be results. That's the cool thing about sports. It's what I love about working with athletes and, and coaches is there's no place to hide. There's no okay. place to not. So it's just a question, doctor. You, you yeah. mentioned that you were a high school coach and, yep. um, and, and, and I, I'm a coach as well, so I feel that a lot of times we're, we try to impact our kids mentally, you know, toughen it out and mind over matter, things like that. So when did you make that shift from just becoming a coach to wanting to go into the, the field of, you know, the medical field and actually become a doctor? Yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to be a sports psychologist. I, I read a book called The Inner Game of Tennis, and I, I've got a bunch of those uh, standing all over my, uh, my office here. But um, the book is written by a, a tennis pro, but he's talking about the mindset, the mental game. Uh, and really, I, I wasn't a tennis player, but I used it my senior year of baseball, and I couldn't believe uh, how easily I was picking up the ball out of the pitcher's hand. And I couldn't believe how strong, I, I mean, my first at bat my senior year, I hit a bomb. I hit a, a three run home run. It was, I'd never hit a home run over the fence before. And I hit a lot of bombs that year. And I was like, the difference is I got a little stronger in the off season, but the, the reason was I was, so di I was so dialed in, I was so locked in. Mm -hmm. So I read that book and immediately after that time, I was like, I, why are we not teaching more around the mental game? It, it had profound effects on me. But I went to college and I didn't know that there was anything about psychology in sport. And it wasn't until my third year in school that I had a professor come up to me and say, hey, do you, what, what do you want to do with your psychology? I like psychology, but he's like, what do you want to do with it? And I was like, I, I don't know. I, you know I, and he's like, well, you're an athlete. You like psychology. Have you ever thought about sports psychology? I said, what's that? Uh, yeah, light, light me up. Show me what that is. And and he took me under his wing and he was, he was a great, great professor and he gave me a lot of information on that. But he also directed me to where I could get additional schooling for that. And okay. there wasn't a lot of opportunity here in, in the state of Minnesota for that. So I, it took me all over the country. I went out to Boston, Tennessee, Texas, and Kansas before moving back up here and starting my own practice. But it was, it was during grad school uh, for that, that I was a, a high school coach and I was back at my high school and I was 
uh, working with our baseball players and, and then our quarterbacks, which was the position that I played uh, for the varsity football team. And, um, but one of the things is, as I was, it was coaching that, you know, we weren't given a lot of, uh, a, a lot of material. There wasn't a lot of material out there for how can coaches, how as I as a coach, could I get material to get into the hands of my, my athletes? There wasn't anything that was either really quick and easy, kind of digestible that, that athletes might like to use. And there wasn't anything that I thought um, really kind of spoke to the heart of what, what is going on between the years. And when we talk about mindset, we really know that there are five pillars that go into the mindset. The first and probably one of the most important ones is your attention. Where are you putting your focus? And we do not, as humans, we are not really good at paying attention to what we're paying attention to. <laughs> we, we sort of leave that to chance. And we know now from the functional MRIs and studying the brain that when we get in a highly stressed situation, our focus naturally goes to threats, per perceived threats or real threats. But in, in, when we're playing sport, it's not a life or death threat. It's a perceived threat. Like what happens if I miss this pitch or what happens if I miss this free throw? Um, but for us as athletes who identify as an athlete, um, that can be devastating. And, and the brain doesn't know the difference between our significant disappointment and thinking that it's a cease to exist threat. So our brains treat missing a free throw the same way we would treat seeing a bear in the, in the woods. And, and it does not know the difference between the two. However, being human and having one of the most incredible things that we have uh, on in this whole universe that we know of in this whole universe is our brain. The human mind is one of the most amazing, most powerful, most intriguing and complex things that we, we, we know. And it has an, an amazing ability to adapt and to develop, even under really tough situations. Right. And if we begin to harness that energy and, and tap it into the right, the right variables, we see growth happen exponentially. And so when, for athletes, when that, you talk about mindset and I don't mean to yeah. cut you off, but it's yeah, just, no, I, I think the greatest athletes and, you know, everyone's just finished watching um, the last dance and, you know, you talk about Jordan and how his mindset was just so much different from everyone else's. And uh, he held that mental advantage over everyone else. Um, he just finds something to drive him. Uh, talk a little bit about that and how, you know, I mean, because of course he had the athletic ability, but it was his mindset, I believe, that just took him to another level. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, one of the things we saw in the last episode or maybe the second to last episode is he was talking about having your mind be in the present, mind be in the present. I don't know if you remember that scene or not, but he was talking about that a couple of different times. And he had, he had done some work with a mindfulness coach, a sports psychologist, um, George Mumford, who was teaching him mindfulness. And mindfulness is the ability to just be aware of where our mind is going. What are, we, what are we thinking about? Where is our attention drifting to? And can we observe that? And mindfulness, if you just lay down in your bed at night and you're just paying attention, your mind will jump from a lot of different things. And you'll go into one thought that's leading to another thought, which leads to another thought. Now you can either just follow that and just ride it almost like you're sitting next to a river and watching some leaves just go right on down the river and you can stay with a thought or a leave and just follow that for a while. And that kind of expands and you get more thoughts from that thought and it unpacks and you get more, or you can just simply allow those thoughts just to drift on by and not really get what we call get hooked on any of those. Jordan was an amazing, had an amazing ability to hold his attention to those variables so those thoughts and those actions, those tasks in front of him that were very present moment and that led to a higher level of success for him. He learned very early, we call, we call his psych profile the gamer profile. He needed somebody or some what we call activation. He needed some something right. to, to make it to be high energy, high, high risk. So he, he wanted to golf, he wanted to bet money because just golfing for golfing's sake and seeing if I can get, that was fun, but let's make it a lot more interesting. Let's activate this, let's make it a lot more pressure filled. 
that's when he thrived. So he started as he got became a pro and he got into the monotony of a long season and a long career and he needed to create things to activate him. Yeah. And so he would create and the, the, I thought the it's hilarious. The, yeah, he did a great job. I thought the <laughs> the documentary did a really nice job of the different things that he would he would actually create. You know, somebody yeah. didn't say that, but he said that they Created. said that just yeah. you know, he get activated. Or, you know, we were we had a discussion with the Timberwolves team. We we debriefed the the last dance, and one of the things that one of the the guys from our staff said when uh, the this this uh, Supersonics coach didn't come up and say hello to him in the restaurant, he was like, "Really? That's how it's going to be?" And he made yeah. that be a big thing for him. But they were like. If he would have gone, if the coach would have gone up and shook his hand, Jordan would have made something that the guy said be another reason for, you know, to get him activated. So yeah. he would have created something even if the guy had gone to say hello to him. And, it, and you know what? I kind of saw a little bit of, uh, of of Jordan and Kobe as well. He would do the same thing. Kobe Bryant would kind of find something and it would ignite him the same way. Do you agree? I, I totally agree. You know, and but the, the two things that those guys have that I think a lot of other people have when we look at sort of this, this, these other aspects of the mindset is they had discipline. They had an incredible, incredible drive. So they wanted this more than anything. And you could see that, that pain and that anguish when Jordan actually achieved his goal, he would release a lot of that. And it'd come out in tears and it'd come out in just pure joy. But there's a lot of pain, a lot of sacrifice. Um, Kevin Warren is now the Big Ten commissioner uh, for, for uh, the Big Ten Conference. He was the chief operating officer for the Minnesota Vikings for a number of years, helped us get a stadium here, helped, helped develop a lot of different community relations. Just a really incredible guy. We had him come in and speak at one of our University of Minnesota speaker series. And one of the things that he often gets uh, from, from people, they're like, I want your job. And he's like, do you? Do you really want my job? Because before you say that, and I know you get to see that, you know, I'm a CEO, or I work with the Vikings, or I'm now in, in the middle of the Big Ten commissioner. Do you know the sacrifices and the pain and the steps and the hard work and all that that I had to go through in order to get here? Because most people, when they start to see that, they say, nope, that's not for me. I'm going to take a different route. But they love to see the championships. They love to see the shoes. They love to see the all of that. But that doesn't come without this incredible hard work ethic. Right. You know, and any guy that makes it to, to the NBA, they either have incredible talent, but they've also had to work their tail off. Sure. More, sure. Than, more than most of us. And what we say is that, and then the best of the best, I mean, the work ethic is just on, on off the charts. Now, you, you talked about your senior year, how you, you picked up a book and it helped you uh, prepare mentally. You were hitting the ball out of the park. Do you think what you know now um, you know, as a sports psychologist with going back and, and being an athlete that you would have been a better athlete or, or what? There, there is no doubt. And that's what I get so passionate about right now is the, the information that we have available to athletes, young athletes, can not only benefit them and, and, and have them enjoy the game, be better at the game, whatever game that is, but it's also transferable skills to anything that you do the rest of your life. Because the way we define it is performance is performance, whether that's on the field or in the boardroom or, you know, wherever you end up in, end up working, we have to be on. And we know that performance comes from this ability to really hold our attention to certain things, have confidence, uh, have the right type of thinking that goes through, uh, through our focus window and in and, and, and our thoughts. But it also requires the right type of behavior. And when we look at the five pillars of the mindset, focus, thoughts, uh, emotions, body sensations, so how the body responds, and then behavior. And a lot of times athletes come in and they want to change how they feel. They want to feel more confident or less anxious. Mm -hmm. And so they'll come in and they hey, doc, can you help me with that? I'm like, absolutely, we can help you with that. And the way that we're going to help you with that is we're not going to focus on that. <laughs> we're going to focus on your behavior and your, your focus, your attention, where are you putting your attention? Because most guys, and I was like this too, and I didn't, I didn't realize this until afterwards, but 
even in college, the first few times I was out on the field, I just remember going running out to the, the huddle and just thinking, why are my legs so heavy right now? Mm. Is my legs are the heaviest they've ever been. Why now? Why during this important moment of my career are they all this heavy? Well, that was just anxiety. But if I had just known like, hey, that's anxiety and that happens, that's natural, doesn't mean I can't run. The thing that's gonna cause the problem is my attention going from my, my reads and my play to my legs. And sure enough, as I'd be walking up to the line of scrimmage, instead of saying, all right, where's the defense? Where's the safety? Who's coming? Who's the, where's the blitz coming from? I was thinking about, gosh, can I drop back? So I was missing, missing my reads and missing my pickups because I was focusing my attention was on my legs. Sure. Now, and I, now, you, you've worked with uh, different sports. Um, how different are athletes in different sports? Like with, you know, uh, say baseball, if you have to have a different mindset kind of when you approach a, a baseball game and, and, you know, eyeing that 100 mile an hour pitch versus being a quarterback and having a 300 pound lineman coming at you uh, or, or even going against a seven footer, you're playing basketball. How are the uh, different sports? Uh, how do you approach those mentally? Yeah, I think every sport and even within those sports, um, you have different sort of skills that you're going to need to hone in on and, and develop. Um, you know, for baseball players, as you talked about, I think one thing that they need to really get used to is failure. You know, they're going to they're going to strike out a lot. They're going to miss some pitches. They're going to. Yeah. And then how do you stay confident? How do you stay not hooked emotionally? Like, man, I'm in a slump or I'm going to off my game's off right now. But we see that with basketball players too. You know, they miss the first two shots or three shots. I mean, that's consistently what I hear is if I miss the first three shots of the game, I know it's going to be a bad game or I'm going to be off. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, I mean, you're shooting 40% from the field. You're, you're, you're fantastic. You're, you're bound to miss two or three in a row at different periods of time. And if that's the first three, well, then keep shooting. And, you know, that 40% will bounce back. Um, and, but we are emotional beings. And if we don't understand how emotion plays and how it, it, it impacts how we think and how we behave, then we're letting our emotions run us versus us managing our emotions. And oftentimes we go and we, we let athletes know that your emotions aren't always accurate. And so when you're feeling anxious or you're not feeling confident, there's, there's not really or may not be a reason why you're feeling that way. And so, and even if you are feeling not confident, we recognize that that might not be the best thing for your performance. So how do we help you get to understand how emotion plays and then what behavior you can do regardless of how you feel? And, and that's what we really begin to train. We talk about there's the natural mind where we have an emotion and our behavior is really aligned with that emotion. So when I'm angry, I'm going to hit something. Mm -hmm. and, and that can end a, a result in something that maybe we want or maybe we don't want. But ultimately, what I work with athletes on is I say, what do you want? And then let's work backwards from that. What are the behaviors that you're going to have to do regardless of how you feel or what happens that you're going to have to do in order to give you the best chance to get that result? Sure. Then let's get really good at those behaviors and let's do those behaviors even when we're angry, even when we're upset, even when we're sad or unconfident or any emotion that we feel, I still can do this. Now that's a trained mind. That's not a natural mind. That's a trained mind. And if we train our mind that way to behave regardless of how we feel, we see much more consistent results. And quite honestly, what's fascinating about confidence, if I start to act that way. So if, if I begin, when I'm not confident, I put my head down a lot. That's just yep. my natural body language is bad. Absolutely. Yep. Body language, shoulders slumps, yep. head down. And, and we know now again, from those functional MRIs and some other tests that when we do that, we actually admit more or release more stress hormone. Mm. So that actually creates us to be more threat focused and us to be less confident. If we put our head up, and our shoulders back, just simply by doing that behavior, we see that we release more testosterone and more testosterone equals more confidence and, and ultimately a, a slower moving mind so we can hold our attention. It's not racing, it's not overanalyzing, it's not threat focused. It starts to focus on the variables that help us perform our best. Right. I can do that even when I feel unconfident. 
So I can put my shoulders back and my head up and I can stand in that superhero stance and I can do that. And if I do that and I do that well, regardless of how I feel, I'm going to start to feel more confident after the behavior. So the behavior will lead to the confidence versus the confidence leading to the behavior, which is what most people get backwards. Now, you talked about the five pillars and uh, how it helps student athletes. Uh, we have over 50 student athletes here uh, participating in this speaker series. But what about life after sports? Um, how do you approach and, and talk to athletes who are, who are at the end of their careers and, and you know, are, are done with sports? Well, the one thing I would say is sport can be one of the greatest uh, teachers for, your, for life lessons for you for the rest of the year teaching uh, how to deal with failure, how to deal with adversity, how to deal with work under pressure, how to be a good teammate, how to, how to listen and have a growth mindset, um, how to develop. You learn a lot about yourself uh, through, through sport. So the self-awareness that can come from, from that is, is really, really critical. And then I say, when you learn those skills, those skills are transferable to anything. I, I was working with a, a division one uh, linebacker and he was a little small for division one, but he had a great mindset and he ended up starting. And it was funny, he was played for the U of M and a number of years ago and the Wisconsin team was great at the time and, and they had an awesome offensive line and they came up, the, uh, all five of the starting Wisconsin uh, offensive line came up to him after the game and said, you were by far the most difficult linebacker to, 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 to play against. Mm -hmm. And he was like, wow, I mean, what a, what a compliment from, from one year. Your, your biggest enemy, uh, and then two, um, from, from a team that was so successful. And he attributed that not to his physicality, but to his, his mental game. But as he transitioned out of sport, so he, he, he knew he wasn't going to go to the NFL. He wasn't big enough or strong enough to, to make it to that level. But he had a lot of concern about whether or not he was going to be able to play or not play, but, but do anything because he had been so hyper-focused on football. Right. He was really wondering whether or not he was going to be able to, to do anything outside of, of sport. Well, we talked about the transferability of all those, you know, I started to break down. I'm like, are you hardworking? Uh, you know, are you a good leader? Are you a good communicator? Are you this? Are you that? And he was like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And he just kept checking along. I'm like, what, if you're an employer, do you think somebody would, would want to hire? He's like, yeah, me, I guess. Well, he ended up, uh, he ended up, he, he got into coaching and he ended up becoming, he's now working for uh, an NFL team because he had a lot of those skills. Wow. He worked his, his tail off. And, um, but regardless of whether he, he stays in coaching or doesn't, uh, he's, he's got all that. And that, that serves people really, really well right. um, down the road. Uh, I just like to tell the uh, listeners or the people that are part of the speaker series, if you have a question, because we're going to we're going to try to uh, leave the last 15 to 20 minutes for questions, uh, you can type into the chat and I'll hand select some some questions to ask Dr. Anderson. Um, so, Dr. Anderson, back to it. Uh, just just, you know, a lot of things happening right now in, in Minneapolis. Minnesota area and just with um, with the George Floyd situation. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, this has been um, something that is incredibly unfortunate and tragedy. I mean, it's a horrific event. Uh, you know, any way you, you cut it. Um, and and for those that 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 don't know, we had a uh, a, a middle aged forty six year old uh, black male, African American male, uh, who uh, died under when he was in custody uh, of the Minneapolis Police Department. And in fact, uh, he actually was asking the officers to get off of him uh, as he was um, as he was suffocating, I believe. And it's created an incredible outcry for, uh, and, and rightfully so, of anger and frustration and grief and pain. And and really, every organization, every team that I'm working with, um, are, are 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 it's really been cool to see. But we're all stepping into that conversation and. Um, the Timberwolves did, I think, a really great job, and Joe Branch, part of this group, is is instrumental in bringing in, you know, some of the top level speakers, and and he brought in some some great people to to talk through some of those things uh, with our team, with our staff, with our players, um, and and I fully recognize that that it's not lost on me that I'm a white male and that I don't fully understand and can't understand how it may feel to be 
uh, uh, an African American male in in our society, day in and day out, and a lot of things that that we, we all have to go through, and that that you all have to go through. But I do understand anger. I do understand frustration. I do understand grief. I do understand pain. And and I think one of the things that is is coming out a lot from this is people have had enough. And, and I think we're in a space where we've got to have the conversations. We've got to have a deeper understanding of where we all are at. And, and we want to do it in a way that we understand, that we, can, that we can learn, that we can understand from one another. Because without the understanding, we don't have the empathy. And without the empathy, we, can't, we won't make the changes. We'll just assume that that's that's that person's thing or this group's thing or this group's thing and 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 we'll start to lump people into those groups right and and that is the danger um that and it's it's the it's the the, the problem that we've had um for 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 decades for generations and it's i think people are at a point where you know enough's enough we we really got to do something and so we're seeing a lot of protesting we're seeing a lot of um uh, you know a lot of people out uh, wanting to talk about this and wanting to get their their message out, and I think we've got to really listen. Right. I mean, I think there's got to be a lot of conversations and a lot of discussion about how to how to move forward with this. How how can you channel that anger? Because you know it's a lot of anger, and um, you know of course the frustration is built up. And I understand you know you definitely want to have um, each other's back in these situations, but how can how can we channel that that anger into into something to have a positive outcome? I think that's an excellent question. That's the question. Um, you know, and I was actually working with one of our uh, Timberwolves players this right before this call. And, um, and we were talking, we were discussing this situation and he was talking about his anger and, and the frustration that he was, he's going through and, and, um, and he's not from Minneapolis, but is here uh, with our team right now. And, and so he's kind of right in the middle of this and he's got a lot of people from his family and his, his circle calling him and saying, Hey, what's going on up there? And, you know, what's your view on it? And, and, and from his perspective, the thing that he said is he's like, he just read a book and it's funny, we're, we're reading this book together. It's called power versus force. Um, and so he just read this book and um, it, it's really interesting. It's a good book. Um, but he's like, I don't want to go out and this is his personal, his personal approach. He's like, I get, you know, I, he's like, I don't, I don't get upset with anybody who's protesting or anything like that. But he said, I don't prefer to go that route because I think what that does, especially if I'm getting in, in voicing that anger and violence um, is that I'm not using the power that I've got. And I want to be better than the people that are creating this pain. And so he was saying, I got to use that anger to shift into power. And how can I use, how can I use that as power? What's power? Well, for him, power is using the platform that he's got to begin to communicate with others, to start to have these conversations with people to change the narrative. Um, but that, that was one of the things that, that he, he had talked about. And, and I thought that was a very wise, a really, really wise for a young man I thought that was a really wise perspective right. um, on how to take this. Absolutely. You know, and then, then just coming back to our, our model, you know, anger is, is one of a very powerful, one of our most powerful emotions. And it's one of the emotions that we act upon because it's just so much energy, right? I mean, when I, when I'm angry, I, I want to, it's fight or flight, baby. And we're, we're, we're going, but we know that again, if I want to be thoughtful about what's the result I want, and, and maybe the right result is I got to knock this guy who's in front of me on his ass. Maybe that's the result. But oftentimes, that's probably not the result that's going to lead us to the long-term success that we really want. Um, and if we are thinking through about what do I really want, then I can come to what's the behavior that's going to get me, even when I feel this way, what's the behavior that I can do to give me the result that I want or that we want as a group or as a society? And sometimes I think it's saying, let's take that anger and put it into this training. What's my plan when I feel that way? Mm -hmm. And can I execute and can I behave this way even when I feel that way? If we can do that as, as humans, we are going to be far better off um, in the long run. But we got to get, get better at it, sure. uh, you know, all of us uh, on, on that front. 
Now, I mean, with, with everything going on with the, with the pandemic, uh, just a, a question uh, that, that one of our um, You Want Game persons had was, is there a good piece of advice you can give athletes and coaches that will help us mentally for next season uh, if, if, we, if we're able to go on with our seasons in the fall during the pandemic? Well, you know, one thing that we're finding a lot is is the mental preparation. You know, I, I think uh, sports psychology or some of the mental game coaches that were out doing some things uh, for many years prior to some of this more better research that's come in has said, think positively, think positively. And, and I definitely think thinking positively is much better than thinking negatively. But thinking positively sometimes sets us up for faulty expectations. And then when we don't have, the, when things don't go the way that we hoped, um, we often find ourselves in a very emotionally compromised place. I get angry, frustrated, upset, lack of confidence. And so thinking positively sometimes can set up an expectation that's not real. So just giving an example of, of quarterbacks, if you go into the season and you're going to throw the ball a lot and you hope or you think that you're never going to throw an interception, when you throw an interception, you're going to be incredibly emotionally compromised and what I want and what I do with the quarterbacks that I work with whether it's NFL power five conferences or high school I want to get them to a place where they are prepared for when adversity hits so it's not just thinking positively all the time it's going through and rehearsing what are the likely scenarios that I'm going to get into and you gotta I mean some of the looks that I get from quarterbacks when they come in they're like tell me what you want me to imagine me throwing interceptions i'm like yeah I, I do i want because i want you to behave after the interception the way that you know will help your team get get across in you to be at your best that next series yeah. and if, if you bounce back sure we're all going to throw an interception here or there but you bounce back that's going to save you from throwing two or three interceptions that game and, and you know what, Doc, sometimes you see that when you watch football, you see a quarterback, uh-oh, then the next time he throws another one, it's just he let his mind take the best of him, and it, it just goes downhill from there. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, and another question, are there any uh, mechanisms you can share with players to use when struggling through adversity in games, hard practices uh, to deal with emotions such as crying or quitting, feeling defeated, Any way we can, uh, any tips that someone could, you know, I know one thing that is to count to 10. I've always heard that. I mean, what other things can someone do just to try to get through some of those emotions? Any thoughts on that, Doc? Are you guys back? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I, it looked like my internet popped in and out okay. there. Sorry. Yeah, we just had a question uh, uh, from, from from one of our students. They wanted to know, are there any uh, mechanisms that you can share um, when you're struggling through adversity in games, dealing with emotions such as crying or quitting or feeling defeated? I know you talked about lifting your shoulders back and, you know, not slouching over, but is there anything else that you can discuss with, with, with us on that? Yeah, you know, in, in this case, one of the things that we do to talk about is what, are, what is our self-talk? And I think there's a lot of athletes that use a lot of highly critici crit high criticism of themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that we understand. I understand why we. He froze a little bit, but uh, I'm sure he'll be right back. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll go through and try to get those answered from Dr. Anderson. We'll see if he can jump back on. It looks like he was frozen. Not sure if there are any storms or anything that way, but um, we'll see. Let me see. We have the uh, legendary Coach McKenzie while we wait on Dr. Dr. Uh, to come back. Uh, Coach McKenzie, thanks for, for joining us. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the things that are that are going on there in in the Minneapolis area right now?
Oh, did you unmute me? There you go. Go okay, ahead. There, yeah, so I know I would uh, try not to jump, jump in as Doc was talking about it, but I mean, a couple things. I mean, obviously right now, you know, our city is got a lot of unrest. Uh, young people, uh, old people, all people are showing a lot of different kind of uh, emotions and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I, I guess if I want to say, if I would say anything to the young men, and it's interesting is because I, I know the other group is in Houston. Uh, the gentleman that was killed here in, in Minneapolis is uh, was from Houston. And so we are tied together in that, uh, in, in terms of what happened. And, and so one of the things is, and I just had a call this morning uh, with my young men. I, I want to, if nothing else, and I'll let Doc jump back in here real quick. I want to encourage them not to get to the place where this is okay. And, and that was a lot of the conversation that I had with, with my young men this morning. While, you know, like anything else, we don't have a cure for HIV. We don't have a cure for cancer or any of those things right now. But we got to keep, we got to stay in the lab. We got to stay in the lab and we got to find a way as to how we're going to deal with this be, to make sure that there's no more Eric Gardner's, that there's no more George Flo Floyd. But what we cannot do is get to that place where this happens so much and so often that we're okay with it. Uh, one of the things is, and I don't know uh, in terms of Doc and how he shared uh, with, with uh, the professionals, but I also want to say to the young men that this is not a time to lean on being macho. Uh, deal with your emotions, deal with your feelings. Uh, if you need to cry, uh, all of those things are okay. Uh, but you really, you, you really need to know that you are of value. Uh, you know, things happen. Uh, but to me right now, even in this pandemic and the things that are going on, this is an opportunity for young men like yourself to become a voice to become a voice, uh, to express, to let people know that you do matter, right? And that you have something to say and that you have something to contribute to this country and that you are of value. And no matter what, we're not gonna be okay with another black, black life being taken and nothing happening. So I, I'll just stop there because I'll, I'll, I'll go on. I wanna get back to Doc. Okay, thank you, coach. All right, uh, Dr. Anderson, you're back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Yeah, Not sure yeah. what's going on there, but no, it's okay. So we were just asking about, um, you know, mechanisms and, and how you can try to get past that adversity of, of not having a good practice, not having a good game, uh, what we can do in that situation. Yeah. So I, pre I appreciate that. And, and coach McKenzie, I really appreciate your, your thoughts on that too. And I, I just want to echo the, the one, one point that, um, that, that recognizing that that the emotions that you're going to face through this is going to be all over all over the map from anger to sadness to frustration and in recognizing and understanding what those emotions are it, it does not make you less of a man it makes you more of a man and we, we're talking a lot about um, emotional intelligence and, and understanding how we can use those things to better ourselves and, and to get the most out of but if we don't understand why and where it's coming from, um, oftentimes the emotion will guide us versus us guiding the emotion. And, and I want you all masters of your own, your own behaviors, your own emotions, uh, knowing that emotions, sometimes they come and go. We can't, we can't control them all the time, but we can control our behaviors around that. And so I just really applaud what, what coach said there, because I think that's, that's spot on. Um, so yeah, so back to the question around, uh, you know, how do we prepare ourselves? Well, I, I, I always say it's good to have and prepare a, your mental plan. What's your plan? So we were talking a little bit about uh, getting prepared. If you throw interceptions, be ready for how you want to respond to that. You know, the one thing that we do say is adversity will hit all of us. And, and we got to know that adversity is going to hit us. It's not that adversity doesn't hit everyone. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, misnomers out there that Jordan didn't go through adversity or, or you know, Kobe didn't do this or didn't have to go through that. Well, yeah, they did, um, maybe in different ways, um, different ways than, than how we all 
Um, but but we we want you all to be masters uh, in recognizing that that's that's up to you and how you respond to that is going to be what people uh, remember about you and recognize about you. It's, they're not going to judge you for going through something negative. They're going to judge you for how you respond to that that negative uh, or that adversity that you've hit. So we prepare. We want to prepare our, our, our athletes for any adversity that they're going through and then get some mental reps on what that might be like. Um, and then I want people to really recognize that if they use imagery, they see themselves out on the field, they see themselves navigating, walking through that adversity, there's tremendous effects. Putting yourself at the free throw line, for instance, and in, in going through 100 shots in, in, as an imagery has significant impact on your physical side. In fact, they've done many, many studies on using imagery for free, free throw shooting, and they found that the actual free throw shooting is the best way to learn, but very close next to that is doing imagery right next to it. And that's better than watching film, it's better than, than, than doing anything else, and yet we don't spend a lot of time going through the mental reps of what we might be getting into. But if you get deep, just to kind of point this out, you get deep into a dream, you wake up from that dream and it felt real, didn't it? I mean, you, it's sometimes hard to recognize the difference between reality and what's just inside our minds. The minds, if we shine the light inside or we were measuring your mind as you're doing imagery, about 98% of your brain lights up the exact same way as you would, as it would, as you are shooting an actual free throw. So if you place yourself there, put yourself in the crowd, put yourself with the, the band in the, in the gymnasium, put yourself with, with the pressure on the line and see yourself hit it. See yourself, feel the anxiety, see it, feel your heart going, feel your legs get heavy like I did, but also see yourself know that you can still deliver that, that ball through that net. Right. And when you start to do that, you're like, I'm ready. I got this. Yeah. But then the final thing that I would say is what we say to ourselves really does matter. And I think this is where I got cut off is the self-criticism piece. A lot of, a lot of athletes are really uh, perfectionistic. They really want the best. They, they expect the best. And that can be a good motivator for us, gets us moving. But it may not be great for our self-worth and our value after that. And so what you say to yourself, recognizing that, hey, I, I am of value. Hey, I can do this. Hey, I, I, I can contribute. I can be a part of this team and I can add value to this team. That can be incredibly important. The one exercise, if we were doing this live and we are in the same room as you all, I'd, I'd bring up a volunteer and I'd, I'd ask somebody to put their hand out just straight out like this. And I would be asking another, another guy just to push down on your arm. And I want you to do that when you're being really self-critical and just notice I'm weak, I suck, I'm no good at this and watch how fast your arm, just how weak your arm is. And you can ask the, your partner on, on pushing that down. Now flip that and start to say some really constructive, positive things about yourself. Like, hey, I'm strong, I got this, I can handle this, you can't push me down, I'm gonna get this. And watch how strong that is. There will be a significant effect just in what you say to yourself in your arm strength, just in pushing that down. Now, it'll be so much that the person pushing down sometimes has to get around and kind of get on top of you to, to start right. doing that. That's pretty significant if we're talking percentages and shifts. And if we could do that from a lot of different perspectives, ooh, watch out. You all are going to you're going to do some amazing things when you get back out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you talked about a, you, you showed a book earlier um, that you were that you were currently reading. But is there um, any other books that you recommend to to coaches or, or the student athletes on to get the more mental aspect and become more focused? You know, one of the books that I think is digestible, it's a pretty quick read, it, it is This Inner Game of Tennis. And even if you're not a tennis player, it talks a lot. And you got Pete Carroll and, and, and uh, others from the Seattle Seahawks. They love this. They give this to every Seattle Seahawk. The Timberwolves uh, have given this book to every single uh, player on, on the Timberwolves uh, staff. And it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting read. It talks about both self one, our critical self, our judgmental self, and self two, which is our doing self. Self too is what Jordan was really good at getting into. And, and that's just being in the present, that's doing what you do. But one of the things that, uh, what we find with a lot of our 
self one is that's a, a lot of inner criticism and judgment. And anytime we're in self one, we're not playing at our best. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, Doc. Any any last um, quotes or any last last words um, you have here? No, I, I just I just wish everybody well during this really challenging challenging time and and uh, you know I want to offer that we're always here as a resource as well and you know here to to help and support in any way that we can. Um, but I just appreciate the opportunity to get in front of you. I wish you all the best, and I hope we get back to sport here soon. I know, I know. It's just it's just um, unforeseen times here. We'd like to thank everyone that jumped on. We have student athletes from uh, Minneapolis. We have student athletes on from Houston, I believe from New York um, and Brooklyn. So lots of lots of students here that have jumped on our first speaker series. Um, trying to find Joe Branch. He's in here. I believe he wanted to say some words be before we let everyone go. If I could find him on there, there's over 50 students and <laughs> coaches in this in this session. Joe, are you there? Can't seem to find him, but what we're going to try to do is, oh, here he is. There's Joe right there. Let me let me unmute Joe Branch real quick. There you go, Joe. Thank you. Um, this was awesome. Want to you know thank uh, Dr. Anderson for coming on. Uh, thank all the students that uh, came on from you know I see some from my high school, Kincaid High School in Houston. Um, I see B Cam out in Brooklyn. You know my former home. I see Coach Green and some of her students, and then my new home. Uh, Coach McKenzie and his crew. So I think um, in the wake of what's going on now, it was no better uh, conversation to have than something around uh, mental health, right? So during this time, I mean, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of numbness. Uh, there's a lot going on mentally. Uh, so I think it was awesome to have a resource like Dr. Anderson to speak to these high school student athletes. Um, I think, you know, I'm a former agent. Uh, a lot of guys go through, you know, struggling with the power of confidence, struggling with shooting, struggling with a lot of different things. So um, I think a lot of colleges as well have sports psychologists, but I think the high school level is where it should start. So thank you guys for investing in yourself today. We want to also thank our management team who put this together. Thank our wonderful MC, uh, Corey Brotherton, who did an awesome job today. And then I think my mentor, um, he's on as well who's the reason behind this organization. You know, you want games, a mentorship organization, I think today just shows how we will, um, you know, move forward virtually. I think this is the first time we've done something with, I think there's some uh, folks from Chicago as well. So that's four cities, you know, we're 50 plus. Today we tried something new, so this is awesome. Bill right here, if you'll, if you'll unmute him to Corey, he might say a word or two, but this is something that we're gonna do monthly. We want to build this tribe, Houston, New York, Minneapolis, learn from each other. And we're all into sport and we all want to stay connected. So thanks everybody for joining the, uh, the Zoom today. All right. Thanks, Joe. All right, thanks, Joe. Do you like to say anything, Bill? Oh, I just, just kind of reiterate what Joe said. This is, this is really, this is really cool. Great turnout. The first time we've done, a virtual you want game speaker series. I think it's really cool that we've got through through Zoom a national tribe coming together. And you want game is all about the relationship that Joe and I have had, that most of us involved you in game have had with each other. It's about giving back. It's about folks who have played the game, taking time to work with high school student athletes who are in the game, not just to sharpen your skills on the field or on the court, but how you transfer that in the game of life and everything we talked about today is, is talked about today is as applicable in your relationship with your friends and your family and as applicable as as it would be for me in business so this was awesome stuff and Corey really appreciate you you do a great job man thank you all right thanks thanks Bill so uh just you know talking to to those two they're the founders of you on game they were both high school both high high school and college student athletes and uh, as you heard from his story, so was Dr. Anderson. So, um, you know, just take everything that you guys are learning from being an athlete and carry it on till your life after sports. We really appreciate everyone jumping on. Uh, we're going to try to get a book out to each school 
um, that Dr. Anderson recommended. Uh, so you guys can pick that book up and, and read it to, to be more mentally focused when you enter your seasons next year. We'd like to thank everyone once again for joining the You Want Game Speaker Series. We'll be in touch for the next one. Thank you so much and be, be safe. Thank you. God bless.